my fee for pretty much anything is a fine. <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a genuine pleasure to be here in uh, Eyemouth. Uh, I'm very grateful to our host for inviting me this evening to speak to you. Uh, it's a lovely place, Eyemouth. Seriously, uh, we got here earlier this afternoon, had a chance to wander about a wee bit, meet a few people. Genuinely delightful to be here. I've done quite a few of these events. Uh, uh, it's, it's good to get away from the computer every once in a while and actually engage with real people. <coughs> uh, but no matter uh, how many of these events I do, I'm always uh, a bit taken aback to find myself uh, sharing a platform with uh, the likes of Ash and Colin here. I was wondering, uh, how did I get to be here? <laughs> uh, and I never fail to be humbled uh, and inspired by the fact that uh, so many people take the trouble uh, to come to these meetings. It's truly heartening to see how politics in Scotland has been invigorated by the referendum debate. And make no mistake, uh, this is politics. Uh, it's the most fundamental kind of politics, constitutional politics, the terms upon which power is exercised in our nation, the underpinning of legitimate authority. Power and authority. Uh, that's what I want to talk to you about this evening. But uh, first, of all, uh, first of all, I want you to do something for me. Uh, I want you to look at your hands. Just hold your hands up in front of you. And take a look at them. Just for a moment. Just ordinary hands. Just hold them up in front of you. Look at them for a moment. Just ordinary hands. Some of them cleaner than others. <laughs> Some of them well manicured. Some of them nails bitten to the quick. Big rough hairy ones. And then there's the men. <laughs> there's writer's hands, musician's hands, worker's hands. There's hands that punish, hands that protect, hands that clean, hands that craft, hands that comfort, hands that care. We pretty much take our hands for granted. But uh, I'm hoping that the, by the time we're done here, you'll look at those hands rather differently. Power. Power is uh, defined as the ability to influence or control. Uh, there are many different kinds of power and many ways in which power is exercised. There's positional power. Uh, the power that derives from having a, a certain status or office. There's expert power, uh, which derives from specialist knowledge or expertise. There's persuasive power, uh, more te technically known as referent power. Uh, it's the, the, the power to attract people uh, to a cause or movement by uh, charisma and personality. Uh, also including the, the ability to affect outcomes by, by negotiation. There's reward power, uh, most commonly associated with economic power, or the power to influence by offering something of perceived value in, term for, in return for obedience or support. And finally, there's uh, coercive power, the ability to influence or control by intimidation or brute force. Power is frequently regarded as a, a dangerous thing. The desire for more power is often portrayed as unseemly or wrong. But power is a natural part of our lives. We all have power. We all use our power. All human relationships are based on relative power. At the interpersonal, group, community, national, international level, relationships are defined by power differentials. All human interactions 
are conducted in the currency of power. Consciously or unconsciously, we are constantly negotiating adjustments in the balance of power between ourselves and the individuals with whom we interact. As we move from the interpersonal to the group and beyond, these negotiations become more formal. At some ill-defined Ill -defined point, we start to call it politics. But in reality, what we call politics is merely an extension of the process by which we work out ways of living together from one day to the next. All of which is a rather long-winded way of telling you that it's all right to have power. It's perfectly acceptable to have power. It's all right to want to exercise that power more effectively. Power is always relative. The power that you have is only power relative to someone else. So it should come as no surprise to find that uh, those who want you to believe that wanting power is bad are those who already have more power than you and want to keep it that way. <laughs> no surprise at all. I'm here to tell you that there's nothing wrong, nothing whatever wrong with wanting power. What is important is the purposes for which you want that power. What matters is how you intend to use power. Now, there is a reason for telling you all of this, and I will get to that reason before my time is up, and hopefully before you all fall asleep. But uh, I realise uh, it's all a bit dry and academic. So let's bring it all back to real life. Let's get down to cases. You and I uh, are involved in a power struggle right now. Uh, we're all exercising various kinds of power in different ways. You're exercising power just by sitting quietly and listening. That in itself is a form of reward power, as is your applause or your laughter. By standing up here in front of you, I am giving you power over me in exchange for the opportunity to apply my power to you. By sitting out there, you're giving me power over you in exchange for the hope, at least, of being informed or inspired or at least perhaps entertained. I have expert power, or at least notional expert power. You assume from the fact that uh, I'm here on this, this stage uh, with this lectern and this microphone that uh, I must speak with some kind of authority. I have positional power. The stage, the lectern, the microphone, uh, they're all like the trappings of office. They give me, they afford me a special status. Each and every one of you has personal power the power of your own free will. Any one of you could decide to start heckling me or to just get up and walk out. If you get up and walk out, I'll just ignore you. Because once you've walked out, your power is spent. Let's face it, you're going to look pretty silly if you come back in, take your seat just so you can do the theatrical flounce out the door again. If you heckle me, I'll just burst into tears, <laughs> and that'll be a lesson to you. <laughs> but uh, at the risk of putting ideas into your heads, what if you all stood up and walked out at the same time? That would be another matter altogether. That would be hugely effective use of a very special kind of power, collective power. By this, I do not mean mob power, which is directed by uh, the base urges of the hive mind, nor do I mean uh, power of the regimented masses under military command. 
When I talk of collective power, I refer to the power that comes from people acting together of their own free will uh, in a common cause. The power that comes from people striving towards a similar goal. The power of people moved to act by a, a shared sense of injustice and a, a shared aspiration to make things better. That's what I mean by collective power. That, I think, is what has brought a lot of you people here tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, I consider myself privileged to be alive at a time when Scotland is seeing in the campaign to bring our government home and make ours a better, fairer, greener nation, we're seeing a massive upsurge of collective power and collective action. I consider myself fortunate to be living at a time of awakening, a time of hope, a time of opportunity, a time of growing awareness, a time pregnant with possibilities, a time of burgeoning self-confidence, a time when the very air thrums with the possibility of change, a time to be savoured, a time to be seized, a time when we can fittingly say, now's the day and now's the hour. Keeping in mind the various types of power that I've discussed, but most particularly collective power, I'd like to now consider the matter of authority. When we talk about government, the terms power and authority uh, are often used interchangeably, but there's an important difference. While power is simply the ability to get people to do things that they otherwise wouldn't do, Authority implies legitimacy. It implies the right and the justification to use power. The idea of authority is very much bound up with the concept of sovereignty. The concept is the very, at the very core of this referendum debate. Where sovereignty is about where power is located. Uh, with constraints on power, which constraints on power, and, and, and with balance between personal and political power. In relation to the referendum debate, the key word here is sovereignty, which we may think of as ultimate authority, or the source of legitimacy in the exercise of all political power. Democracy is pooled sovereignty. In a democracy, we each of us lend a portion of our own personal sovereignty to a common authority in order that this authority might so order things as to make it possible for us to live together in a large and complex society. In one paragraph, that's democracy. Independence is the power to decide the terms on which all sovereignty is pooled. A word I like to use is rightful. To me, that word seems to convey uh, the twin ideas of having a right to power and using power in the right way. So you'll often hear me refer to the independence movement as the campaign to restore Scotland's rightful constitutional status. The campaign to put power in the right hands, your hands. I am unshakable in my conviction that sovereignty rightfully rests with the people. The people of a nation are the ultimate source of the authority by which political power is exercised in that nation. It's the people, it's you, who give legitimacy to political power. Political power exercised over the people without their informed and democratically expressed consent is not legitimate. It does not have the necessary authority. It is not rightful. 
it is, to put it as plainly as we might, wrongful. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the situation that we have in Scotland at the moment. A wrongful situation. A situation in which the political power to which we are subjected lacks legitimacy. A situation in which the sovereignty of the people, our sovereignty, is explicitly denied. This is not to say that we are oppressed in any sense uh, that this term might usually be understood. It's a situation that exists uh, due to history, due to the very nature of Scotland's political union with England. It's, it's a product of Scotland's subordinate status within a union that was contrived in a different age for purposes that were never relevant to us. A union that we, the people, had no part in creating or sanctioning. An anachronistic, dysfunctional, corrupt union which serves none of the people of these islands well. A union which was always intended to serve the purposes of the ruling elites. A union which, in that regard at least, has not changed one iota in the last three centuries. A union that sucks the human and material resources out of our nation and in return gives us government by parties that we have emphatically rejected at the polls. A union that imposes policies which are anathema to our people, policies which have been rejected by our democratically elected representatives. A union which were we being given that option now, not one of us, not one of us would vote to join. But a union which we are nonetheless being asked to vote to remain in. The referendum is our opportunity to rectify this unsatisfactory situation. It's our chance to put right all that is wrong with the way in which power is distributed and exercised. It is our chance to reclaim our sovereignty. It's our chance to lay claim to the power that is rightfully ours. It is a moment of truly historic significance. Our opponents in the anti-independence campaign have uh, tried to diminish the significance of this moment. They have tried to reduce the referendum to nothing more than one of the petty partisan squabbles that characterises the British political system. I resent this. I resent this deeply. I resent it because what we have in this referendum is something really special, something unprecedented something that is worthy of so much more than the appalling, unremitting, grinding negativity of the No campaign. It is something which transcends what we have come to regard as normal politics. It is certainly something which transcends the cold, soulless calculations of dismal accountants. What is special about this referendum is that it puts power in your hands. Real power, effective power, transformative power. Power such as rarely, if ever, been held by ordinary people, even in the most effective democracies. I cannot stress enough how special this power is. It is difficult to convey to people accustomed to seeing their vote having <coughs> little or no effect just how much power this referendum puts in their hands. There's a lovely picture uh, of uh, Alex Salmond and uh, David Cameron uh, that was taken just after they signed 
the Edinburgh Agreement. It's the no campaign. Uh, it's taken just after the, the... They were waiting for their cues, the mention of Alex Salmon that did it. Uh, it's, it's a picture that was taken of uh, Alex Salmond and David Cameron uh, just after they signed the Edinburgh Agreement, in which uh, Salmond looks like he's struggling to stem the, the rising tide of smugness uh, uh, within himself. Uh, and Cameron is uh, slapping his forehead as if he's only just realised what he's done. I like to uh, imagine that, uh, that it was a conversation and they just signed the thing and they went outside and Alex says to him, you realise what you've done? And he explains to him in a couple of short lines exactly what that agreement means. And Cameron goes, Oh, I never realised! <laughs> Alex Salmond was entitled to be uh, very satisfied with himself uh, because what he and his team gained with the signing of that document was huge. With the signing uh, I, I could do a full 20 minutes, half hour, just on the, uh, the political and constitutional significance of the Edinburgh Agreement. I won't. I'll simply say that uh, with the signing of the Edinburgh Agreement, uh, the British state effectively recognised Scotland's status as a nation. Now remember, the British state had previously denied Scotland's status as a nation, saying that Scotland had been extinguished by the Acts of Union. The Edinburgh Agreement recognised Scotland's status as a union with a right to self-determination. The agreement, uh, agreement also had the effect of tentatively accepting the sovereignty of the people of Scotland, contrary to the doctrine of parliamentary sovereignty that underpins the British state. I say tentatively because in strict legal terms, the British state could simply overrule the referendum. No matter how decisive the guests vote, Westminster could, in theory at least, simply decide to ignore the result. In reality, of course, uh, that's unlikely to happen for uh, a variety of reasons, <clears throat> not least international pressure. But the fact that the ruling elites of the British state could, with perfect legitimacy in terms of its own constitution, ride roughshod over the democratic will of the people of Scotland, vividly demonstrates just how broken the British state is. The referendum is our chance to fix things. It's our chance to get out of a broken system and create something better. And by doing so, quite possibly, provoke change in the system we leave behind. The referendum is special in another way. It's special not just for the power that it puts in our hands, but for the way in which that power has been won and the manner in which it is being exercised. We can be truly proud of the that the whole business of establishing our right to hold a referendum and organising and conducting that referendum has been an exemplar of peaceful democratic process. We can be, all of us, truly proud of that. The hands that have taken unprecedented democratic power have not been sullied by one drop of blood. As Alex Salmon said, nary a nosebleed. And that's impressive. Given the history of independence movements in the world, that is impressive. And it truly is unprecedented power that we will hold in our hands. For 15 hours on Thursday, 18 September, those ordinary hands will be transformed into arguably the most powerful democratic tools in all of history. That is not an exaggeration. Those hands will hold the fate not of mere transitory governments, but of nations. Those hands 
will hold a combination of all the different types of power that I spoke of earlier, with the obvious exception of coercive power. Uh, as they say in the, the Spider-Man movies, I think it's in the Spider-Man movies, with great power comes great responsibility. Uh, is that the Spider-Man movies? I, I spend too much time on internet to be watching the movies. With great power comes great responsibility. As you use this power, you'll have to ask yourself some serious questions. Not questions about whether you will be a few pounds better off or a few pounds worse off. Nobody can answer those questions meaningfully. Uh, and it's likely that every attempt at an answer that you've heard, uh, ruling out the most obvious, ridiculous scare stories, uh, every answer that you've heard is as likely to be right or wrong as any of the others. The one thing that you need to know about economists is that they are nearly always wrong about nearly everything. <laughs> In all of history, no economist has ever predicted any significant economic development or disaster. Not once. And yet, they're trying to tell us what we're going to, that we're going to be a few pounds better off 20, 40 and 50 years in the future. Pshaw, I say. <laughs> the question that you will have to ask yourself, the questions I should say that you will have to ask yourself, uh, are much more fundamental and vastly more important. They're questions about power and authority. Questions about who should exercise power in our nation? Questions about who has the authority to bestow and constrain power in our nation? Questions about where sovereignty lies in our nation. I've tried to convey some sense of the awesome nature of this power that you, we, will hold in our hands on 18th of September. I know that you will use that power thoughtfully. I hope that you will never have cause to regret your decision, whatever that decision may be. Personally, I could not in good conscience vote anything other than yes, because to vote no is to deny not just Scotland's status as a nation, but the sovereignty of Scotland's people, us. All that I ask is that you respect the power that you hold in those hands. Because I know that respecting that power and seeing the wisdom of keeping it in the hands of the people of Scotland, you too will surely vote yes. Thank you.